Welcome to VRProud.com. This guy needs no introduction. Mikey Ma took former LSU outfielder, national champion. Of course, you can catch all this stuff on the Miked Up podcast on YouTube, right? Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, YouTube, we're live Mondays and Wednesdays from 6 to 8 p.m. and Fridays from 1 to 3. Appreciate y'all tuning in. And uh, if you don't like it, that's okay. Tune in anyway and tell us you don't <laughs> like it. That's fine. I love it because it is, I mean, it is your season. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, I love uh, talking football with you. Yep. Nothing. Right. Uh, feels like Mikey Ma took, like yeah. baseball season. You're in the middle of the SEC slate, and, and it truly is. It'll be a big weekend on the road. But let's talk about and just kind of recap Kentucky. I thought it was a very strange series, to Absolutely. be honest with you. Um, Kentucky, because I've got a couple of beat writer friends there in Lexington. They, they said they didn't really know the name that went out there for game one. Tells yeah. me they punted game one, right. and they said, let's go win the series and there were some ways that they could have. Yeah, that's a bold strategy. We talked about that <laughs> a lot actually on our show last night. Is It felt like they, they punted game one, which mm-hmm. I am in the camp of thinking like, hey, I'd rather take three games to try to win two than say, okay, we're just going to give away one and try to win two in a row. LSU hasn't done given up two in a row all year. Yep. So the likelihood of that happening is not high. They come in and throw a guy that hasn't started all year on, fr- on Thursday, not Friday. I hate the Thursday, Friday, yeah. Saturday things. But Thursday – and LSU 10 runnels them, 16 to 50, whatever, 16 to 6 or whatever the final score was, took care of business, hit a bunch of homers, did what they needed to do, move on to the next day. And next day they don't – Kentucky wins, LSU doesn't, doesn't win. They don't play great. I don't think that the score really indicated exactly um, – the pitching didn't pitch as bad as the score indicated, at least I think. Well, and that's why I thought it was – I don't want to say effort, but like just overall, I thought it was maybe the worst played game of the year. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's some fluky things. Obviously, that a fly ball land in right yeah. field that probably shouldn't have. And if you talk to Joe Barry, you say that I got to catch that a hundred times out of a hundred times. Yeah. Those things happen. You had some issues with with you know not being able to throw some strikes, getting free passes. Like those things happen. Sometimes you just have to chalk those games up and say this is just baseball. It's just the way it works. They Kentucky wins 13 to 10. Now they're not a team that scores a whole bunch of runs, right? They play a little small ball. They scored 13. They had a bunch of earned. Uh, they scored a bunch of unearned runs, and so mm-hmm. I think that was kind of a, an anomaly type mm-hmm. of game. And you move on to the Saturday game. People didn't think they got it in. I think they did a really smart thing by not making a doubleheader on Friday, keeping it on Saturday. It's Louisiana. <laughs> this happens all the time. I think Jay's starting to realize, like, just because it says it's going to rain doesn't mean it's going to rain all day. And it didn't. Obviously, the game started an hour later. And LSU played, Jay said, best game they've played in two years. Right? Most fun game they've played here in two years. And it was a 7-6 game. Kentucky showed that they belong in the top part of the SEC. They play a different brand of baseball. Some people may not like it. It may not be as fun. But it's getting them results this year. And it kept them in the game. Ultimately, LSU did enough to win on that Saturday game, which I think is the main thing, is if you can go and win the SEC series, take two out of three, that's the most important thing. And what have been their best games every single time? It's the response to a loss. Yep. And, and so, you know, I look back into that, um, you know, last time LSU was in Omaha, and, and they took down Oregon State, mm-hmm. you know. Don't let us win one or we'll come. Right. They lost to Oregon State, and then they beat Oregon State twice. Which Oregon State had, I want to say, single like digit losses. 62 and 4. Yeah, something, something crazy. It was something crazy. They didn't know how to lose and rebound. Right. right. This team does. And yep. I think that really kind of it helps with that DNA once you get to all good teams. Absolutely. And you have, if you look at the first five ga- uh, series of the SEC schedule this year, it was as hard as it could have been. True. Minus, let's uh, say you take AM out and you put, well, by the time AM was a top five team, right? But. You don't well, they're think heating it, up too, right? And they're playing better, right? They're yeah. seven and eight in conference play. They're they're on. They're moving in the right direction. You put in Vandy. We don't have to play Vandy or Florida, but those two teams <clears> were the only two teams at the time that we could have played. That said, okay, this is the hardest schedule you could have faced. You've gotten through that. Yeah. Now you get to the back end of the schedule. I'm not saying it's going to get easy, but these teams are you should beat, right? You can't say, can't lay down because this is the SEC. They can always come up and beat and, and and win. Look, Georgia beat Florida this past weekend. Like that can happen, but you've gotten through the gauntlet. You're getting past it. I think that LSU is in a position right now where, yeah, they may not be hitting on all cylinders, but you don't want to be hitting on all cylinders right now in the middle of the season. True. You want to you want to be doing that towards the postseason, towards the end of the year. And I think that they're in a good spot to do that, right? I think you're getting some guys healthy. You're getting some of these young guys with experience on the mound. I think that they're they're mo- they're moving that way to where hey, when the postseason hits, we're going to be where we need to be. Well, you're starting to hit on something that I, I think we want to dive deeper into because. Mm-hmm. 
um, you know, hide the sharp objects in the tall buildings for some of these <laughs> LSU baseball fans. Yeah. It's like we, we were promised this uh, amazing bullpen. I think you still have an amazing bullpen, but people need to be in the right spots and Absolutely. play their roles. You can't have – uh, you know, you, you can't have what you had last year and a guy pitching all three games of an SEC no series. No doubt. And, like, look, before the year started, before the injuries happened, you looked at what you had and you're like, wow, this is an embarrassment of riches yep. on the mound. Starters, we have five starters. Two of them aren't going to be able to start. You're going to put them in the bullpen. Grant Taylor was going to come out the bullpen early in the year. Obviously, he went down with Tommy John. Chase Shores came in throwing 100 as a freshman. He started to start playing really well, pitching really well. He was a vital part of that rotation. He goes down with an injury. Then Garrett Edwards starts to emerge. He's like, oh, this is our closer. Boom, he goes down. So that tells me, okay, what's going to happen? Good teams figure out how to adapt and overcome, right? Mm -hmm. They adjust to the situation. They have young guys step up. And I think that our bullpen is in a really good spot. I think they're really talented. It's just different names that you aren't expecting to see in those roles right now, right? Gavin Guidry is super talented. He wouldn't be here. He came in as a shortstop slash pitcher now he's right now he's a pitcher right he is he's got the mentality he's got the mindset to to be the closer and, and close out games and be in those you know pressure pack situations oh, yeah. um, but you also have Ackenhausen who's a freshman you have Griffin Herring who's a freshman you have these guys that you can Bryce Collins is looking really good so you're you move some of these guys out that you thought you were gonna have to rely on they get hurt or they don't they haven't pitched the way, way you wanted to you move in these some of these younger guys who maybe are good, you just didn't know how good they really were. Now they're getting that opportunity. So now it's a matter of getting these guys comfortable, allowing them to figure out their role, right. and then excel through that. To me, the biggest key, though, is, is having another, your starters over the weekend kind of figure that out. Well, that's why I say that, like this is my favorite time of the year. These were like the storylines emerge. Yep. And I got into the business to, to tell stories. Yep. And you see, historically, you would go every single year, especially with you know some of the national champions, and you go, I didn't know that guy's name in, in you know, March. Yep. But, man, in May, he, he, we, we couldn't replace him. Tell you what, how many people that watched LSU, I don't care how big of a fan that you were or are of LSU baseball, nobody could have predicted Chad Jones was going to throw meaningful innings in Omaha in the postseason in 2009. Nobody could have thought that. Yeah. But that's the beauty of baseball. That's the beauty of sports. You don't ever know who's going to step up and be that guy and take hold of a role in a situation when it's needed most. And that's what he did. And I believe that's what all these freshmen are about to start doing. Yeah, it's the greatest reality show that there is. Yeah, so you get Javen you, Coleman you back, know, too. You get Javen Coleman back. Uh, speaking of reality show, the uh, screaming and the yelling was apparently all <laughs> in my Twitter this past weekend. When, yeah. Look, I, all I said yeah. was it was a little too much. Yep. Um, you know, yelling when you're, you know, Still in the batter's box. Right. Second home run. I understand the emotion. He, he, they're quick pitching him, which I know is uh, one of your pet peeves. Yep. All of the things. All I said was, yeah, he deserved a warning, basically. Right. Right. And uh, all of LSU baseball Twitter erupted. I yep. know you. I, you were an emotional player. Yes. So, so kind of walk me through. But you are a little bit old school to, to some little, of these kids. A little bit. Yeah. Right. Like I'm. I'm 33. I don't feel like I'm old. But the, to the, them, but I'm old. The, but the bat flips yep. were not. They weren't as prevalent as they are now, right? Yep. They're not as celebrated as they are now, right? Yep. This, that part of it, which back even when I came up, and I, like, I had no problem with that, right? right? That was just one of those, I think it's fun now. If you're throwing bats over the dugout and you're throwing the bats <laughs> like 20 feet in the air, that's one thing. That's, that's probably a little overkill, right? But what I saw from Bear Jones on the homer is a few things. One, I, I, I understand the too much thing. Like, I understand, like, oh, it looks a lot, like just the, the visual of it and – and the appearance of it looks like it's a lot. The, the, the certain words he used Absolutely, as right? well play into yeah, it. Yeah, like it's right on screen. Like you see it. Like I understand that, right? But you have to understand the situation. And let me like frame this out for, you know, not just you for everyone, yeah. right? Like quick pitch is something as a hitter that's the biggest pet, one of the biggest pet peeves of mine. I know every hitter that I've been a part of, they absolutely hate it. And what a quick pitch is, it's not like, oh, the guy's ready, waiting to your set, and then they go really quick. No, it's he's trying to pitch before you're ready. Yeah. Right, and so you feel like it, the guy's kind of taking a, get, taking advantage of the system, mm -hmm. and you don't like that as a hitter. He did that to Bear Jones on strike two, right? You could see he stared at the pitcher after that. He didn't like that. So the next pitch he got in the box a little earlier. He tried to do. He tried to throw him another fastball. Didn't happen. Hits the 450 foot home run. His second home run of the game. Yeah. Also the the to take the lead in the bottom of the six. So it was a big homer, big situation. Sports are emotional. Right, it's a very emotional, game, especially after something like that happens. Yeah. And so, he let the emotions get to him, and he he was a, he let the pitcher know that he didn't like 
the quick pitch, which I have no problem with. I get the, the appearance of it. I get the words that were said. I get that everything's on camera now, and I understand that it could be deemed as too much. I think that you're right. I think the umpire handled it the right way. Hey, here's a warning. I know it's emotional. I know it was a big moment. I know this, but can't be doing that. If you're going to do that, you got to maybe try to be a little bit more discreet with that. But in my mind, I didn't have a problem with it because I know the emotions happen, and I know the, the way the game happened. I know the situation that happened that caused that to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So I had no issue with it, but I'm with you. I think the umpire handled it the right way. He really did, especially when you look at the Georgia-Florida series and how an ump completely didn't oh. control the game because yeah. that's, what, that's what they did at the LSU-Kentucky right. game with, in that instance. He was, he was giving a message to the teams, look, it's, it's not getting above this. Right. Right. The guy, Georgia-Florida, completely made the game about him. Yeah, I mean, that, that to me, I mean, that's awful. Like, that, yeah. I, I don't even have words to, to describe, like, that was a big moment in the game. Bases loaded, two outs, up two. At home, you get a big strikeout, like you should be able to show emotion. Now, yeah. I don't care if you look at the dugout or not. You should be able to show that emotion, and you should be able to get away with it. And he tossed them out the game, and I don't think that was the right situation. I don't think yeah. that was the right move. And like you said, you should have given him a warning and said, and even if he did give him a warning, that still should be able to go. And Because he didn't say anything, do anything. He just, it was emotional. And you don't want to take the emotion out of sports. Exactly. I, I love where where baseball has gone. It, it's it's felt very new yep. in the last five to ten years in, in kind of rebranding some of this and some of the celebrations. Mm -hmm. Now, we've gotten rid of the the, the boom box, unfortunately. Yeah. I love the boom yeah, box. Yeah, I, love, I did love but the boom I, box. But I love Paul Skeens, the eject. Yep, me too. I mean, he's an Air Force guy. Absolutely. He's the eject. Come on. Like, Absolutely. This is fun. Sports is supposed to be fun. But, like in Bull Durham, if you use a certain term to blue, yep. blue is going to do this. Yeah, you're out. And so you're out. there will be limits, but go out, have fun. That's what we do every single week right here with Absolutely. Mikey Montuk. And, Absolutely. of course, don't forget, more of this, more a lot of this. Me and Jay Mitch. Come Jay see us. Mitch, I love Jay Mitch. He, we got to get him in we studio. We do. We do. But uh, we do. check him out. Mike Up Podcast with Mikey Montuk. There you go. They're on YouTube and, of course, all the social media platforms. He's Mikey Montuk. I'm Brian Holland. Thanks for visiting BRProud.com.